Our Lord Jesus Christ declared that the Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and truth. Would you come with me and let us magnify the Lord together as we turn to sing Psalm 45, the second version, we'll be singing verses 5 through 9 and using tune number 169. Please join me in prayer. Shall we stand together in honor of our God? We come, O Lord, to our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. We come, Lord, to exalt you, the great God of the covenant, who keeps covenant to a thousand generations, a great God who has covenanted and sent forth the mediator of the covenant, our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that he might dwell with men and he might offer up himself a sacrifice for sin for the people of God, that we, through him, might be reconciled to our God. We who are wayward and sinful, sheep who have gone astray and are in need, Lord, uh, of the tender mercies of our God. Lord, we come before you this day with our hearts aware of the wonders of your grace and also, Lord, aware of how far short we have fallen of your glory. We come, O oh Lord, as a people who know what it is to be broken, whose hearts convict us of our wrongs, and we're mindful, Lord, of, of the wonders of your grace by which we have been bid to come and draw near. 
through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we, we come, O oh Lord, now to confess our sins before you, to acknowledge before your throne, Lord, that we have uh, sinned against you in, in thought and in word and in deed. We've sinned against you by the actions of our lives and by the inactivity of our lives where we've left undone the things that you have required of us. And we come, O oh Lord, seeking afresh that, that cleansing from on high, that the blood that was once for all offered on Calvary's cross and delivered to the throne room of heaven might be applied to us afresh, Lord, that we might sense the promise of our God fulfilled, that if we confess our sin, that you, O oh Lord, are faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. O oh Lord, we rejoice that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. And Lord, we, we come humbly before you to say thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your gracious dealing with us. Thank you, O oh Lord, for taking wayward children and bringing us back into the fold. And Lord, ministering to us and sustaining us as our covenant God. O oh Lord, we thank you that there is that precious love that you bear to us, Lord, by which when we are wayward that you chasten us as a father. Lord, that you do not let our sins uh, pass by as if uh, they were insignificant, but Lord, you, you, you correct and Lord, transform us, Lord, as you prepare us for your heavenly kingdom. Lord, we rejoice to, to hear that good tidings, Lord, that we believe in God, believe also in your Son, who's gone forth, the Lord, to prepare a place for us, that where he is, we might be also, that he would return and take us to himself. And Lord, we thank you for the gracious work of your Holy Spirit by which we are being prepared for that place that our Savior is preparing for us. And so, Lord, we would pray that, that you would draw us to, to adore you, that you draw us to grow in grace and in our knowledge of you, Lord, that we, we might, with a great joy and delight, look for that day when we will appear in your presence and we will behold the face of the Savior and, and see the fullness of the glory of our Heavenly Father in the face of your Son. And, Lord, we will be made like him. Oh, Lord, we, we long for that day of his return. And, and Lord, we, we look forward to that day when we will depart this wor world to, to enter into the presence of our blessed Redeemer. Lord, that we might be among the number of those in your presence, uh, spirits of those made perfect, of just men made perfect, Lord. Oh, Lord, what a, what a precious delight we look forward to. Nor, Lord, not that we hate this world and, and that we hate uh, these circumstances that you've given to us, but, Lord, we look forward to the fulfilling of your great promise, Lord, of salvation. And, Lord, we pray that you would hasten the day of the coming of our blessed Redeemer. And, Lord, we do now ask as we remain here until that time, oh, Lord, we we ask, O oh Lord, that you would work your gracious work in our lives. Increase our love for you. Diminish our love for the things that are forbidden of us, Lord. Lord, grant us that we might know more of you. Lord, that we might have a hungering and thirsting of, for your word. And that we might be led by your Holy Spirit, Lord, to take up the word daily and and, and, Lord, not to just read it out of a sense of obligation and of duty, Lord, but to read it with a delight that our God speaks to us through his word. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would, would cause our lives to so flourish, Lord, that we might truly be lights in this world, that others seeing us in some fashion might see Christ in us. Oh, Lord, that we might uh, be able, Lord, to, to, to demonstrate to one another and to the watching world the, the transforming power of the, 
of the Holy Spirit to work and, and transform lives. Lord, that others might see that we serve a living God who works in reality in our lives. And so, Lord, we do pray that you would grant a powerful working in our lives. Especially, we pray, Lord, that our, our witness might go forth in this world to, to win others, Lord. But especially that our witness might be mightily seen within our own homes. Uh, to our spouses and to our children and to our children's children, Lord, that we might, Lord, show forth the glory of our redeeming God. Oh, Lord, we do pray for those who are lost in this world. We pray, Lord, that you might send a day of refreshing. Oh, Lord, that you might bring a mighty harvest in, not only in foreign lands, but, Lord, in and, and places near and, and close to us, Lord, that we might see, Lord, the, the gospel transforming people's lives. And, Lord, we do pray that you would rule over those that rule over us within your church, Lord Jesus. And, Lord, we pray that you would rule over those who rule over us in the civil government, for you have set each one in their place. And, Lord, we do pray for them. Lord, that you would humble their hearts before you, that they might be righteous shepherds, Lord, that they might kiss the Son, lest they perish in the way, that they might be instruments in your hand to advance the mighty work of your kingdom in this world. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Have mercy upon us. Lord, uh, give the, the faint-hearted encouragement, Lord, Touch the lives of those who, who bear chronic illness and affliction, Lord. Lift them and bless them, Lord. Make them to know that the Lord, our healer, is present with them. And, Lord, we make this prayer in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us continue to declare the praises of our God as we turn to Psalm 22. We'll be singing verses 14 through 20 using tune 98.
Please turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. Let us listen carefully. This is the word of God. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man-child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant twixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man-child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. And God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt call, not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? And shall Sarai, that is ninety years old, bear? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the same self day. 
And God said unto him, as God had said unto him. And Abraham was ninety years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael his son was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the self same day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael his son. And all that man of his house, born in the house and bought with money of the stranger, were circumcised with him. Thus far, the reading of God's word. To him be the glory. Amen. Let us continue singing from Psalm 22, uh, beginning now at verse 21 and singing through verse 26. And the tune is 143. Join with me now in turning to our New Testament portion, to, Rev to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Hear God's word. 
What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to, pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned, when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had not yet been being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up for our offenses and was raised up again for our justification. Praise be the Lord. 
for his holy word. Amen. Let us again uh, turn our attention to the word of God, and I would draw your attention to one chapter back in the book of Romans, in the first two verses of Romans 3. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? And the answer is given in verse 2. Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. I come before you this morning to speak to everyone, especially who has a believing parent or a believing grandparent. Because the verse here might be applied as it speaks of a relationship of Jewish people and their relationship to God, whether they've come to Christ or not, there's certainly reason to believe that there's application that would come to covenant children, children of believing parents or believing grandparents in what Paul states here. He asked this very important question regarding Jewish people who have not yet believed in Christ. And he says, what advantage hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? He's talking about those who are in covenant with God because they are of the offspring of Abraham. And then he says, even in their unbelieving condition at that point, they still have a tremendous advantage. And the advantage is, among other things, that the oracles of God have committed, have been committed to them. And as we think back to the Old Testament passage we've read, we have framed out for us in Genesis 17, God's clear defining of the nature of his covenant relationship with his people. And he says there in verse 7, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Romans 4 that we read defines for us that this covenant that God made with Abraham was a covenant of grace. It was a covenant based on faith, not on works. He, he clearly defines that for us that we would understand that this covenant relationship with Abraham was a covenant of grace. And so that covenant that God made with Abraham is, in, is the same covenant that God makes with believers under the new covenant in Christ Jesus. A covenant of grace. And he applies this to not only the believer, but he applies this covenant to the children and grandchildren of a believer. We see in Genesis chapter 17 how God required Abraham to have Ishmael, his 13-year-old unbelieving son, to be circumcised under this covenant of grace that he made with Abraham. And he says that this covenant that he's made with Abraham will go from generation to generation to generation according to the promise of God. And so later on in Romans chapter 9, the Apostle Paul would write to the church in Rome and say, who are Israelites? And then he begins to define the, the blessings that come to the Israelites. He says, to whom pertaineth the adoption 
the, and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. And these promises that God made to Abraham were made to all the children of believers, as we see proclaimed in Acts chapter 2 at verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, some would like to say, oh, this, this is just broadly saying that this promise is, is to all that the Lord would call. But, but we see God saying regarding those who haven't been redeemed by the, the gift of the Holy Spirit, that the promise, there's certain promises that belong to them. And so I'm here to share with you, particularly young people in the congregation this morning, that there is an advantage to you in being a covenant child. Maybe you haven't embraced the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior yet, but there is an advantage to being within the covenant community. And I hope to lay out for you this morning that uh, these blessings do apply to you. It's very clear that the Lord Jesus Christ believed that the promise that was made to Abraham had specific relevance to the children who were covenant children. Let me illustrate this very quickly before I begin laying out for you the advantages that the Lord in his word declares that are, are those who are covenant children. For example, if you'll re recall with me in, in Luke chapter 18, the, the gospel writer records for us a circumstance on one day where the parents of small children are bringing their children to Jesus for Jesus to take them up and bless them. And Luke makes it very clear there that the children are being brought are infants. So they're, they're not, with a lot of cognitive skill, they're simply being brought by Jewish parents to Jesus for Jesus to bless them. And children get noisy, as we hear them sometimes in the congregation, and they make little noises, and they disrupt the hearing of some of us who are having trouble hearing at times. But it's wonderful they're here. Because what did Jesus say? When they were trying to turn these children away, his disciples were pushing them back and saying, Lord, send them away. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom. And then we're told that Jesus took those little children, even infant ones, up and he blessed them. Blessings of the covenant. Now some might uh, readily say, oh, isn't Jesus so loving? He, he loves all little children. But again, the gospel record tells us something a bit different than oftentimes the conclusions that people jump to. For we move from this circumstance where the parents are bringing as covenant parents their children to Jesus for a blessing, and we move to Jesus moving through a part of the country inhabited by Samaritans, as it were, and he comes upon a circumstance where there's a Syro Cyrus Phoenician woman whose little daughter, young daughter, is demon-possessed. And this woman comes and falls at Jesus' feet and, and worships him and, and pleads for Jesus to help her. Do you remember the story? It's recorded in Matthew 15. And Jesus answers to this woman. It is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. I hope you get the connection of what I'm, I'm trying to explain to you. The attitude of our Savior regarding covenant children is, suffer them to come and let me bless them as he did. Those whose parents were unbelieving, he said, it's not appropriate to give the rights of the covenant to the children of unbelieving. Cast it to dogs. 
Now, the beauty of that story, God, I mustn't leave it undone, is this woman so expressed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that though she's not one who appeals to Abraham as her father, but she's Syrophoenician, she's, she's as an outcast from the Jewish community, the covenant community, she expresses such faith in the Lord Jesus that Jesus heals her demon-possessed child. And keep in mind, it wasn't the faith of the child. The child was possessed of devils. It was the faith of a believing mother that Jesus rewarded by casting out the demons. It's, we see that the Lord's design is for children of the covenant especially to come and worship him and glorify him by embracing the promises that were made to Abraham so long ago through the person of his seed that would come, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might glorify God. And we, we see testified in the New Testament, John, the apostle, the beloved apostle of, of Jesus, testifying that G these children do belong to the Lord. There's a temptation to push children back, but, but we see in, in John's epistle, in John, 1 John chapter 2, at verse 12, John says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young man, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. Now, there's different opinions on how to interpret this passage, but I would suggest to you, beloved, that he's talking about different age categories, fathers, young men, little children. Now, John often uses the term little children to speak of everybody in the congregation because we're all little children of God. But here in this particular passage, in this particular context, he breaks it down into age brackets, as it were. And he includes in this age bracketing a statement, I write you, little children, because you have known the Father. I write you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. You see, John who was one of those who was chasing the children away, has come to a point in his understanding of his ministry that Jesus welcomes children. And it's always been the case. Psalm 148 and verse 12, we read there, both young men and maidens, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent, his glory is above the earth and heaven. So I speak to you covenant children this morning, covenant young people. It applies to adults in the room as well. If you have a believing parent, a believing grandparent, there are advantages, advantages to being under the covenant. And, and you're under the covenant just because you've been born to a believing parent. You say, well, maybe I didn't choose this. Well, you know there's an advantage to be a citizen of the United States. Did you have to apply to be a citizen of the United States when you were born in this country? No, you automatically became a citizen of this country. In similar fashion, just being born to a covenant parent makes you a part of this covenant. It's not because of wishful thinking because we come from a particular doctrinal background. It's not wishful thinking just because your parents would love to have God's blessing come upon you. We go back to what God said to Abraham, the father of our faith, and he says, I make this covenant with you and with your seed after you. God's the one that established this relationship. You can't just say, oh, I just don't want to be a Christian. My parents, uh, they're just trying to force this on me. You are under the covenant by the nature of your birth. And if you choose to walk away from the covenant, you are a covenant breaker. Just in the same way, 
if you had been born a number of years in this na years ago in this nation and as young men you were still under the draft and you were drafted to go to war because you're a citizen of this country and you walked off the line and abandoned your duty, you would be put before a firing squad and killed. You are under a covenant with God by the nature of your birth. Now let me tell you the advantages because that doesn't sound very advantageous to say, well, if I just don't want to be a covenant, I can't walk away from it. But what are the advantages of being a covenant child? First of all, there's certain benefits that belong to every covenant child. Whether you're an Isaac or an Ishmael, whether you're under the covenant of grace or whether you're outside the covenant of grace, uh, in the sense of, of, of having the benefits of salvation poured out on you. The scriptures make it very clear, first of all, that there is a tremendous advantage to being a covenant child. As we read in Romans 4.2, because the oracles of God have been entrusted to you. Young people, there, there's nations around the world where the word of God has not entered into everyone's home where people have the benefit to read the word of God. You have the benefit of having the word read in your home. You have the benefit of being able to sit on the preaching of the word. You are familiar. You may not like it at times, but you have a benefit. I mean, you stop and think of it. If you've ever been caught with something and you, uh, for doing something wrong, you say, but I didn't know. And what's your first response? Well, if you didn't know, you know, how can you blame me? I, I didn't know, but you try that in court the first time you get a, a traffic ticket. Well, officer, I didn't know. And what is the judge going to tell you? It's your responsibility to know. It's our responsibility to know, and, and everyone will be held according to the righteous standards to, to stand before God at the judgment seat. And so, beloved, it is, whether you like it or not, it is really a tremendous advantage to have the oracles of God that tell you of what's required of you, but also that tell you of the tremendous blessings. I mean, other people in other cultures will stand before God without the word of God and at the judgment, and they have, from their own conscience, will tell them, I'm convicted of this or I'm not convicted of this, but they will perish without Christ. But the oracles of God tell us of the glorious coming of our blessed Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a message that's so precious. It's the only message by which we must be saved. It's the only name under which we must be saved. It's your advantage. You have this message before you. Others haven't heard it. There's another benefit. There's a benefit in living within the covenant community. Uh, we read earlier when he says that, that they, they were Jews in Romans 9, and, uh, and they have you know, numerous blessings that are theirs. They, they have the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law. Well, it's an advantage to have the giving of the law. You might not think so because you tend to focus, if you're not in Christ yet and in love with the law of God, you tend to think, oh, it just it gets in the way of my life. But it's a tremendous advantage. What if we didn't have the law of God operative in your covenant home? Now, young people, you know at times your parents don't always do what God says in the word. You probably can see that even when you get irritated about them trying to make you do what God says. But God's covenant is operative in your home. In various measures, in each home, it's at work. And if you didn't have that, you wouldn't have the benefits that come from a family influenced by the wonderful word of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 8, 
the Lord speaks to Israel in the Old Testament and, and, and he, he says something that's most profound regarding the benefits of a covenant uh, life within the covenant community. He says this, and what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? What's he doing? He's comparing Israel to all the other nations around. He's comparing Israel to nations where they worship Moloch. The worship of Moloch, the parents would take some of the little children and, and lay them on an altar and, and sacrifice them up to their demonic gods. You don't have that in Israel. Not when the parents are being obedient to the covenant. There's advantages because God gives a, a wonderful way for us to live in community. In Leviticus 19, he tells us that we should do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt respect the person of the poor and honor the person of the mighty. God's saying the judgment it doesn't show favoritism to anyone. He, he's saying contrary to what you see in our courts oftentimes today in the United States, where favor is shown to one who doesn't have because they look at this guy over here and they say he can afford to lose some money. He's got plenty of it. We'll give it to this guy. And it's not based on, on righteous judgment. It's, it's favoritism to the poor. But then on the other side, uh, you often hear them say how many people of the African-American community are in prison disproportionately. Some of that is because they disproportionately at times commit the crimes. But there have been times when, at least in certain communities, where people of a particular race and a particular parentage have gotten to walk away without the effects of their crime. Because favoritism was shown. We see this recently in young basketball players who stole in China and get to come home. That was favoritism. Now, what, what would have been exercised, the judgment had been exercised against them would be horrific in China. But they got to come home. Admit it, thieves, and they got to go free. You see, God has a justice system for his community of people that is, is absolutely glorious and wondrous to live under. He has laws that those who are injured should re receive restitution. I can remember years ago, someone broke into my home and stole things uh, after a fire we'd had there, and they kept doing it every day. Finally, I stopped it by sleeping in my car with a shotgun in order to get them to stop stealing. The response of the officer is, we can't sit here all the time and watch your house. There's other people to take care of. Don't you have insurance? The assumption is it's not a matter of righteousness. Well, you've got insurance. You've got to protect yourself against the thieves. But you see, God, in, in his regulations, and we could go in law after law after law that God gives, he does it for our good. That's the comment that God gives us. I made these laws for your good. And it's an advantage, young people, of you living in a home that's Christian because you are having applied, at least in varying degrees, a standard of living that's far superior. Little children, you're here. In some countries of the world, your mommy and daddy may get a divorce. And your mama decides to remarry. And the new man doesn't want you to be his responsibility. And so mommy sends you as a five-year-old out on the street to fend for yourself. You see, God has regulations that protect against such wickedness and, and, and lack of kindness. There is an advantage to being in the covenant community. I encourage you parents in dealing with your covenant children to take time to show them God's law and show them the advantage of the laws that God's given us because every last one of them have been given for our good, yours and mine. I must move on.
there's the advantage of, of parental instruction. There's the benefit of parental instruction. God requires it. God says in, in Genesis 18, 19, right after he made covenant with Abraham, as it's recorded in, in chapter 17, he says, for I know him, speaking of Abraham, that he will command his children and his household after him that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he's spoken of him. The blessings are going to come to the children through the parents teaching the children what God has said in his covenant. God required them to daily teach their children. When you rise up, when you lie down, when you walk by the way, in every circumstance, the children will be taught by their parents. David speaks of this in Psalm 34 when he says, Come ye children, hearken to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. David didn't do a good job of this. He did with, with Solomon, but there's one of his sons that said he never rebuked him once. Why? Because David violated the commandment of God to not multiply wives to himself. See, this isn't always accurately, faithfully applied within a believing home. But there's still much blessing that's in it. And so it is. Under the new covenant, God intends the children to be taught by their parents. Ephesians 6.1 Kids, you probably heard your parents quote this to you. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. But verse 4 goes on to say, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You see, the same plan of God for the extending of his covenant from generation to generation is, is shown in the new covenant as well. In fact, the Lord has taught us, and we rightly recognize, what's our hymn book? Our hymn book is the book of Psalms, is it not? And what does he teach us to sing in this still very relevant book in the lives of God's covenant people? Well, we're going to close today in a little while with a portion of Psalm 78. A song that's still relevant. We sing it because it is relevant. And at verse 4 we say, And we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them and even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. You see, this is God's intended way. He has benefits for covenant children. But then I draw your attention, he makes promises. Now, the benefits apply to every covenant child, whether you're believing or not. But what I'm going to talk about now are the promises God makes, and they're conditional promises. They're, they're based on a condition that must take place in order for them to be fulfilled. And the first one I would mention to you, and, 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 and keep in mind, this is so important. Because it's only going to apply if it's applied by faith like it was for Abraham. Keep in mind that both Esau and Judas were covenant children. Esau sold his birthright. And some of you young people are in danger of selling your birthright. Judas betrayed our Savior. And of him it was said, uh, he's a covenant child. And of Judas, it was said, it was better if he'd never been born. But here are the blessings that come, the advantages, because a promise has been made to you, and you have the oracles of God that teach you about these promises. And it's the promise of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, Peter's pe preaching at Pentecost, and he, and he says to those who believe, 
This promise is to you and to your children. And what's the promise? It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I start with this promise, which is conditional. You have to have this gift of the Holy Spirit or you're not born again. You're not an heir of the a heavenly kingdom of God. You must have the Holy Spirit. Everything else, that, every other promise that I talk about will be meaningless if you don't have the Holy Spirit. Those who are led by the Spirit, these are the children or the sons of God. This is the message of Romans 8. If you have not the Spirit of Christ, you are none of His. It's not just, oh, I've got to memorize what rules and what conduct of life that I have to follow, and I'm going to be, what would you be? A good Pharisee. You do things in a particular way feeling very self-righteous at times because you got it right, seemingly, and you're still on your way to hell. The gift of the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential. The Lord's promised this. And, and, and the gift of the Holy Spirit will make your life absolutely, if you haven't already experienced it, it'll make it absolutely wonderful. It's the Holy Spirit coming into a person that, that brings this vitality and life in, in Christ to you. Even in the Old Testament, Isaiah, the gospel writer, I call him of the Old Testament, in Isaiah 44, in verse 2, we read, Thus saith the Lord that hath made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. I will pour out my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thy offering. And they shall spring up among the grass as willows by the watercourses. One shall say, I am the Lord's. Another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. Another shall ascribe with his hand unto the Lord. He's saying, this is what happens when the Holy Spirit gets poured out on people. I belong to the Lord. I'm the Lord's. How many of you young people have been taught, oh, this is the way I'm supposed to behave and so forth, but you don't have this confidence this, within yourself. I belong to the Lord. It comes with the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. You might say, well, how do I get the Holy Spirit? Well, in the scriptures, we're told at times the, that the Lord himself simply, without you asking, has granted to people his spirit. He just gives the spirit. But we're also told if you don't have the spirit, how you can get the Holy Spirit. We have very little time for what I'm trying to cover with you this morning, but if I commend to you Luke chapter 11, verses 1 for, through 13. In Luke 13, 11, it begins by the disciples asking Jesus to teach them to pray. It goes on to give an illustration of, of a man who has a, a visitor who comes to his house at midnight and he has nothing to do to refresh the man from his long journey. And so he goes next door and he pounds on his neighbor's door asking for the neighbor to bring food so he might feed his guest. And the man is reluctant to come and he keeps pounding. The man says, well, I'm in my bed with my children. Essentially, go away. But this man is determined and he keeps pounding and pounding and pounding until the man gets up and gives him what he asked for. And Jesus uses this as an illustration to teach us to ask of God. He's teaching us how to pray and specifically teaching us how to pray for the Holy Spirit. If you take the time to look carefully at Luke 11, 1 through 13, you'll see that recorded there. He says, ask and it shall be given to you. And actually in the original Greek language, it's saying, keep on asking. It's not, oh, I asked once for the Holy Spirit and nothing happened. Well, haven't you ever been at the grocery store and see a little child who wants something off the shelf? Mommy, I want it. No, no, you can't have that. Mommy, I want it. You keep asking, you keep asking, you keep asking. Well, I'm not commending that to young children for how to get things, but you see the persistence of a little child. And the Lord's trying to teach us this kind of persistence to get the Holy Spirit, because if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not a Christian. 
If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you have none of the blessings that are promised through Christ Jesus as the seed of Abraham that's been promised by God in his word. And God goes on to tell us then how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? That's verse 13. He said, You can have the Holy Spirit. And if you don't see the evidences of his working in your life, will you keep pleading and pleading and pleading until God answers your prayer with you knowing it's coming from your heart? I'm the Lord's. You write a covenant with the Lord. I belong to him. I am his. That's a promise. It's conditioned on you receiving the Holy Spirit. And then what goes along with this, beloved, and I've got to move on quickly, is God tells us for those who have his spirit, he will write his commandments on your heart. This is the greatest promise for covenant children. Because any covenant children has lived very long, child has lived very long, finds yourself in conflict at times with the commandments of God. And there's something that you find really burdensome that you don't want to do. And, and you're resistant to it. But there's a vast difference when God writes his commandments on your heart. Now it's not mom or dad reminding you uh, you ought to do this or you ought not to do that, but it's, it's coming from within you by the indwelling spirit of God inside of you, and you want to do what's right. There's many places that speak of this. Time won't allot it all, but I simply draw your attention to Ezekiel chapter 36 the Lord tells us at verse 25, certain things will take place when he gives us his Holy Spirit. He says, then I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your unfilthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit I will put within you. I will take away your, the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. It's the indwelling Holy Spirit writing the commandments of God on your heart. John would later say in, in 1 John chapter 5, his commandments are not grievous. I don't mind. What grieves me as, as a child of God is when I find that I haven't done what God's commanded me to do. It's then that I run back to the Savior and I ask for forgiveness for my sins. And I'm reassured by the words of the Holy Spirit given through the Apostle John. I have an advocate with the Father, even Jesus Christ the righteous, who makes propitiation for my sins, for yours as well as you look to him. It's a glorious, glorious thing that God does when he changes your heart. To make you want to do what he's commanded to do. And then following up on this, there's, there's another conditional promise that's there. That God will bless you when you're obedient. God will bless you. There, there's scripture after scripture after scripture that, that relay such things. But I'll just use one familiar passage that we sing. Psalm 1. In verse 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Delight, you hear that? And in his law doth he meditate day and night, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That doesn't mean you don't have hard times. There are hard times. 
But when you are in the Lord, many are the trials of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all. I was just relating to someone earlier th this morning. How they asked about how my wife's doing. I said, well, she has good days and she has bad days. But we always try to remind ourselves from Psalm 34, many are the, are the trials, the troubles, the difficulties, the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them. And if you, if you don't look at it in a simplistic way, but look at what God actually says in his word, he doesn't say you won't have problems. He says he'll get you out of the problem. You have a problem today, he helps with that problem. Two days later, you have the problem again. He gets you out of that. He's constantly getting us out of trouble. And beloved, he rewards those who are obedient to him. The Lord looks with the light. As mentioned one of the prayers earlier today, the Lord's ready to give us more than we can think or ask. He, he, he yearns to pour blessings out on his obedient children. And he withholds certain blessings because you're disobedient. And why does he do that? Because there's another blessing that comes to covenant children who are in Christ by the Holy Spirit. God promises to sustain you in your relationship with him. The Christian life is not a particularly easy life. It's not like, oh, you believe in Jesus and you die to go to heaven right away. No, you, you have ups and downs and trials in life. And, and you have times when you are walking with the Lord as you ought, and you have times when you're not. But what God promises to those who have his spirit and are in Christ, he promises that he will sustain us. Hebrews speaks of whom the Lord loves. He chastens, Hebrews 12. And there's a beautiful promise that's given in Psalm 89 regarding covenant children if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments then I will visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes that doesn't sound very good does it but he promises to do it why because I love you nevertheless my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. Jesus said, no one can snatch you out of my hand. My father is greater than I, and no one can snatch you out of his hand. You have a heavenly father who will sustain you. You want to go for a time of rebellion? What's he say? I'll give you my rod. I'll give you afflictions. But I will not keep or take back my promises from you. He promises that. Now, every, every teenager that I've known through the years, almost everyone anyhow, has gone through times of rebellion. You think, oh, you know, I'm not sure I like all this. But I've noticed through the years, though, because of God's faithfulness, that many, many of them come back again. They're not Esau's and they're not Judas's. They go for a time away from the Lord. And the Lord who says he goes after that one sheep is strayed and he brings them back. And when you come back, you know what? There's a great likelihood, young people, that you'll have children of your own. You'll have children of your own. And you'll be hoping that it's the same hope that your parents have for you, that you would come to the Savior. You'll be hoping that for your children too. God promises his blessing to your children as well. We've already read it, but I simply reiterate that again and again, there's passages of scriptures where God's saying that he will keep an everlasting covenant but the psalm 103 verse 17 the mercy of the lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness to children's children to such as keep his covenant and remember his commands to do them this reward is there to children's children god is the same his years have no end 
the children of thy servants shall continue and their seed shall be established before you is the, is the testimony of Psalm 102, verse 28. God's promised that he will act and keep his covenant. The last scripture I'd share with you, Isaiah 59, verse 21. As for me, this covenant is the, my, I'm sorry, as for me, God speaking, as for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. You see, there is a tremendous advantage to being a covenant child. Tremendous advantage. It gives hope to you young people if you'll seek the things that I've shared with you today. It gives hopes to your parents when they're worried about whether you're going to walk with the Lord or not. It gives hope to grandparents who are here who are praying for your grandchildren who have been rebellious. God is a covenant God. But these are not guaranteed. They come when those draw near and take God in his word. May God grant us grace to make application of his word in, his, in our lives. Shall we stand for prayer? Our Heavenly Father, we come to you and we ask, Lord, that you would minister your grace to covenant sons and daughters who are in this place. Lord, we pray for the salvation of those who have never known the Savior before, who've never heard the word of the gospel preached. Lord, we long for souls to be saved everywhere. But Lord, we, we've come before you and we proclaim the, what you have stated in your word regarding the seed and the seed seed of believing parents. And Lord, we ask that you would quicken your word in the hearts of your young people, Lord that you would bring life and vitality by sending forth your spirit to bring about the fulfillment of the things that you have promised. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's conclude by singing that portion of Psalm 78 that I referred to earlier. Psalm 78 will be singing verses 4 through 8, verses 4 through 8 to tune 149.
receive the blessing of our God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with you. Amen.